Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Chris Bolzan, GMGI's Chief Operating Officer, and I'm so excited to bring you tonight's Science Hour. This is our last talk before we break for the summer and return this fall with an exciting new slate of speakers. But we're going out with a bang tonight as we host our Dr. Martin Chalfie. As many of you know from joining us over the last three and a half months of the COVID-19 quarantine, in these talks, we invite members of our board and of our science and education networks to pull back the curtain and help us better understand the major challenges they are addressing in their work. A number of these talks have focused on the pandemic response, while others have featured alumni of our Gloucester Biotechnology Academy and marine biologists addressing challenges to marine and our ocean, marine life and our ocean's resources. Tonight, we are fortunate and honored to be hearing from Nobel laureate Martin Chalfie in what promises to be a fascinating discussion of his decades of work and that of many others behind the discovery and development of one of this century's most important scientific tools, green fluorescent protein, GFP. Marty will be introduced by GMGI co-founder and board member, Mark Vidal. Mark is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and the founding director of the Center for System, Cancer Systems Biology at Dana-Farber. When Marty's keynote talk concludes, Mark will lead our Q&A session. Many of you provided questions in advance, thank you for that, but you are welcome to submit questions through the Q&A tab of the Zoom and we will make every effort to have Marty answer them this evening. One quick note before I turn it over, as you know, GMGI relies on the generous support from private philanthropy to help operate our research and education programs. For all of you out there who have been so generously supporting us, thank you. And for those of you who are new to GMGI, I hope that you'll consider supporting our work and please feel free to reach out to me directly with any questions. So with that, I'll ask Mark to take it away. And uh, again, welcome everyone. Okay, thank you, Chris, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be with us on this beautiful Cape Ann evening. So tonight, uh, I have the great privilege and, and really a great, it's an honor to introduce Dr. Marty Chalfi as our last speaker of the season. So Marty graduated from Harvard College in the 1960s and received his PhD from Harvard also a little bit after that. But then he went on to work under the supervision of Sidney Brenner, who really single-handedly developed the use of a little worm called C. elegans. So note the word elegance here, a little worm called C. elegans to be used as a model system to, to study fundamental aspects of biology. So Marty took part of that project with him, moved to Columbia University in New York City in the early 80s, and he's been on the faculty there ever since. Now, in the winter of 1994, I remember perfectly where I was sitting. I was in a Mass, uh, Mass General Hospital building, looking over the, the Tobin Bridge, for those who know. And uh, I, somebody came over to me and gave me that week's science magazine. And the first thing I saw, obviously, was the cover. And it's the, it was then, and it still is today, the most beautiful cover I've ever seen. Uh, scientifically and otherwise, perhaps, Marty, I think. It was, it was written science, of course, right? That's, that's the magazine. And nothing else. A little worm, and the worm was glowing. It was growing a green color. And I've talked to many of my colleagues after that. Everyone has had that same or has that same recollection. Oh my God, this is big. This is unbelievable. Is this really what I think it is? And then two seconds later, oh my God, that's a Nobel Prize. So Marty was the first author of that paper, still is the first author of that paper. And he went on to win the 2008 Nobel Prize Chemistry and shared it with Osamu Shimomura and Roger Chen. For those who are interested, Shimomura was at Woods Hole when he made the discoveries that I'm sure Marty uh, will describe. So Marty, it's a fantastic night for us here. Welcome, uh, welcome to Cape Ann. Welcome to uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts, you know, virtually, but still. 
and uh, welcome to the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute. I want to say two more words. You're very inspirational, and I'm sure that will come through in your talk for two of the things particularly that we're trying to accomplish. One is education, and I love your background. If you can, at, some, at any point, expand on how you, get to, how you got to do what you did. It, your life story is, is incredible. And number two, our scientific goal is to discover fundamental principles, discover information in the ocean using genomic techniques. And you know, your work is the best example of that ever, and I think it will remain the best example for a long time. So you're sort of a beacon for us. And again, thanks for your time. Take it away, Marty, it's gonna be fun. Well, thank you, Mark and, and Chris. I, uh, I, I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be a new experience. It's going to be, I hope, a lot of fun to uh, talk about this. What I want to, uh, let me share my screen so I can show you my, I can start the slides. And, uh, let's, oops, where are we here? Should be on full screen. Can you see that? Good. So uh, what I really want to talk about is some myths about science, about how science is done, who scientists are, and uh, this, uh, and then I'm going to tell the story of green fluorescent protein and my involvement with it. Uh, as an example, that uh, is really a counter example of all the myths that I'd seen in science, or at least that I was taught when I was a kid. Because I would read stories or hear stories about famous scientists, and it would give me an idea of who a scientist was and what they were supposed to do. So what were some of these myths that I hope I'm going to dispel today, but I think they're still around. So the first one of these myths is that scientists are geniuses, that somehow it is some sort of innate ability that people have. And if you don't have it, forget it, because you're never going to be a scientist. Uh, here at Columbia University, uh, I've been talking to my friends in the chemistry department, and every year they go crazy because students come in and the first science course they take at the university is general chemistry, and some of them who have been showing really wonderful promise get a B and they say to themselves, I'm no good, I just got a B, I'm gonna go to economics. <laughs> they leave science completely, drives the chemists crazy. That's because people think I have to be perfect from the beginning or it's no good. Complete nonsense. Another one. We don't have a lot of time to tell scientific stories, and so we just get to the point, the most exciting thing. And so it makes one think that scientists' experiments work the first time every time. And that's maybe because they're geniuses. Another point is that scientists think differently than any other people in the world because they use this peculiar method of thinking called the scientific method, in which they come up with a hypothesis that explains a problem that probably no one else has ever thought of before. And because they have this hypothesis, they then think of the experiment, the experiment proves the hypothesis, and they're off and running. Uh, another aspect of all of this, these stories about Einstein and about uh, Newton and Galileo and all the famous scientists of the past is that these scientists worked alone. Now, it does seem that in the stories of the great scientists, they could have an assistant, and I'm not really sure why, but as far as I can tell, the assistant's name had to be Igor. But beside that, uh, they worked alone. That science is an occupation done by loners. And the final thing about all the great stories of scientists from the past, is it gives one the impression that, uh, and except in very rare instances, Marie Curie, George Washington Carver, other than them, all the great scientists in the past are white men. So these are the myths that I'm gonna show are 
sort of nonsense. I want to get at this last one right away. If you go online and do a search for images of famous scientists, even today you get uh, what's shown on this next slide. And what you see on this next slide is except for these two people, Marie Curie and Rosalind Franklin, they're all European or European descendants. Uh, uh, there, you have to go start another slide over to be able to get George Washington Carver. Uh, I don't believe in the first set of maybe a hundred that there's a Chinese scientist. This is a completely distorted view of who scientists are and what uh, and and what makes up a lab. And to show you that, uh, I'm going to show you a picture of the people uh, over the last, I'd say, seven or so years in my laboratory to show you what it actually is. You see that we have people here from Chile and Canada and Peru and Colombia and China and Iceland and the Gambia, Greece, Vietnam and Israel. People from all over the world, all different types of people. That's what makes up a lab these days. So that last myth, I think we can completely dispense with. So I wanna tell the story of GFP and give you an example of how uh, I think science sometimes gets done. And, um, but I have to tell you how I got started in this because as Mark pointed out, I had gone to England to work with Sidney Brenner and John Sulston uh, on uh, this tiny little worm called uh, Cenerebditis elegans or C. elegans. And I was studying the nerve cells in this animal. And in the late 1980s, my lab had cloned several genes that we were interested in that we knew were important for a particular set of nerve cells. And we wanted to know, did those nerve cells turn on that gene or was it some other cell that needed that gene that somehow affected the nerve cells we were interested in? And so that would be a terrific problem, but people had solved it. They knew how to look at which cells made, activated which gene. So we know that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And so one way of telling if a gene has been activated, if it's been turned on, is to simply ask, do we have the protein made? Where is the protein made? So you could use an antibody to see where that protein is. Or because DNA makes RNA, you can use a process called in situ hybridization, and that will show you where the RNA is made within the animal. And you see that there's certain dots uh, in this animal that you can, where the RNA is made. And similarly, we can have the gene that we're interested in do the work for us and have that gene turn on not what it usually makes, but something that we can see in the middle of the, the third of the four panels here, beta galactosidases and enzyme. And when that enzyme is present because the gene turned on its production, you see a blue color. And so that would answer the question where the cells are. Now, before I leave this slide and really get to the story of GFP, I wanna point out the color code that I use for the people whose pictures you're going to see. So as you see here, Huang Ping Du was a graduate student in the lab and Shohei Matani was a postdoc in the lab. And they were the ones that did these particular experiments. Everyone that's worked in my lab, their names are going to be in red. You're going to also see pictures of people uh, that have been collaborators, that have worked with us, and their names are going to be blue. And finally, there will be some people whose names are in black and those people did something I wish I had done instead of them. So uh, let me give you the first of these people. Uh, in 1989, I was sitting at a seminar and I heard the story of this man, Osamu Shimomura, and his work with the jellyfish Aquaria Victoria. Now, Mark, I'm going to have to correct you because the work he did was at Friday Harbor Lab uh, in Washington State, and then he came to work eventually at the Marine Biology Lab. But in any case, 
1962, he did a fascinating series of experiments. And this is what I heard about in 1989. Now, I want to just say one thing before I tell you, tell you about his work. One of the things I didn't show you on that slide about the worms is that the worms have a very wonderful property as far as this story is concerned. They are transparent. We can look right through them. The other thing is that we're interested, as I said, in which cells turn on which genes. And so it's with those two ideas in my head that I heard this seminar about Osama Shimomura. Now, Osama, who shared the Nobel Prize in 2008, uh, led a, a quite amazing life. Uh, and I urge people to go to the NobelPrize.org website and read about his life. At the age of 16, he's told he has to quit high school and work in a factory. He can't work anymore. He can't be in school anymore. And it is because he was working in the factory that he was somewhat saved because where he was living at the age of 16, it was 1945, and it was Nagasaki, Japan. And by working in the factory, he was sufficiently outside the city so that when the atomic bomb destroyed the city, he was protected. Although he does say in a memoir that he wrote that by the time he got home uh, through all the uh, rain, of all the fallout, ash, and everything that was coming down, his white shirt had turned gray, and he uh, attributes to his grandmother forcing him to take a bath immediately, that he was probably protected from radiation uh, sickness. In any case, after World War II, he uh, goes and works in a laboratory as a technician. And as a technician, he makes a wonderful discovery that has to do with the, a problem of bioluminescence. That is, how is it that some organisms like fireflies and glowworms, and as I'll say, the jellyfish, can actually produce light? And he made a discovery that cracked open uh, the entire area of research that his boss was working on. And as a result, two things happened. First, he was invited to come to the United States. And second, because his boss realized that he would be able to get a larger fellowship if he had a PhD, his boss gave him as a going away present a PhD. And so he comes to the United States and he starts working at Princeton, a man named Frank Johnston, and together they go to Friday Harbor Lab. And that's where the story really starts. In, and in all of this work, Osamu was working alone uh, on the project. He wanted to understand why it was that this jellyfish produced this beautiful green light. And so he's a, he was a very, very good biochemist and he isolated proteins or tried to isolate proteins from the jellyfish. And this is where we start to deviate from myth because the experiments failed every single time. He could not isolate anything that produced light from the jellyfish, prep after prep after prep. And no matter what he tried, nothing worked. He got a little bit of an effect by changing the pH of the solution, but basically it was failure for the entire summer. He started bribing his kids to catch him more jellyfish so he could do his experiments. And he just kept working at it. And one evening, he had worked all through the day on the prep. It was dark finally outside. He was getting hungry and wanted to go home for dinner. The experiment failed again. So he decides that's it for the day. He takes the prep and he throws it in the sink. Now the sink had some probably some seawater, probably some other things in it as well. But he just throws the stuff in the sink, turns off the light, and is about to go home when he looks back at the sink. And to his amazement in the dark, 
he sees that the sink is glowing. Now, this is not official scientific method, but I do know of people who have dumped their preps on lab benches, sometimes on the floor, picked them up and suddenly they worked. I'm not really advocating people do this, but it worked in this case. Because he went back to the sink and he thought to himself, why is it suddenly producing light? What was in the sink? He starts thinking about the seawater and he realizes, wait a minute, seawater has calcium ions. I've never tried calcium ions on this. And so after a couple of days, he redoes the experiment. And now every time he squirts in a little solution of calcium ions, he gets a flash of light. He has found what is missing in his experiment. And so he uses the ability now to see light being produced to purify the protein that's producing light. Completely accidental discovery. And he's very happy. He names the protein after the jellyfish. He names the protein a quorin. And a quorin plus calcium produces light. One slight problem, it's the wrong color light. Instead of it being green light, it's blue. He adds calcium to all his other fractions. It doesn't produce green light. As far as he can tell, there is nothing that produces green light. So another accident, another problem. And he goes and thinks about this for a while and says, wait a minute. What if there is a protein that could absorb the blue light and give green light off? And so he goes back and looks at all the fractions again, but this time with a handheld light that he can stimulate the solutions. And sure enough, there's another one of the fractions with a completely different protein in it. And that protein when you shine blue light on it, you get green light out. In his paper in 1962, when he talked about the purification of a quorum, he included a footnote that said, there's this other protein, if you shine light on it, it'll produce green light. I'm gonna call it the green protein. We these days don't call it that, we call it green fluorescent protein or GFP. And so in the jellyfish, the reason it produces green light is because a quorum plus calcium plus GFP is needed for the green light. But you don't need calcium. You don't need a quorum. You can actually get it to work simply by shining blue light onto the molecule and green light will come out. And I'm, to remind you, sitting in the audience hearing about this discovery. You have to remember that I have a limited amount of ideas in my head. One is that I work on a transparent animal, so light would be able to get out and go in. And I want to know where genes are expressed. And I realize if we could put this protein, have this protein made by our genes, we would be able to see where those genes were active and we'd be able to see it in living animals. We wouldn't have to do all the preparations that we had to do beforehand. I know I didn't mention this before, but in order to get the antibody to work, you have to fix the animals and permeabilize them. They give you a static view of what's going on. For the beta galactosidase, the same thing. For the in situ hybridization, the same thing. You have to prepare the specimens. That means they're killed. They are fixed so nothing moves and they're permeabilized so the reagents can get in. But if the animal could just make this protein, all we would have to add is light. And because it's transparent, the light would be able to stimulate this and we would see green. And this would serve, and I have to say the molecule actually looks like this, this would serve as a lantern that we could actually see within the cells. And so I was exceptionally excited about this idea and um, actually didn't listen to the seminar at all after that point. I just fantasized over the work I wanted to do. And then um, I 
found out that there was this scientist, Douglas Prasher, who was actually at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute at the time, and he was in the process of cloning the gene for GFP. I also had a wonderful graduate student who just entered the lab, Kia Eskirkin, and she had come from a background of working on fluorescence in our in my own school's Columbia's engineering department, where she was, she got a master's in chemical engineering. And so I convinced Gia that this would be a wonderful project to try. It, we weren't sure if it was going to work at all, but her first experiment as a beginning graduate student was to take the gene from Douglas and put it into bacteria, into E. coli. And you can see here on this page from her lab notebook, one month after she started graduate school, she was able to get strongly fluorescing E. coli bacteria. And the picture that you see in the lower right-hand corner is in fact a picture she took on that very first night. This, this page from her lab book also points out one other thing that I like, and that is that she used the microscope in the engineering school. This is in her old lab. Why did she use the microscope there? My microscope was a piece of junk. And as a result, she wasn't sure whether the experiment worked or not, but she realized that my microscope was not very good and she knew where a good microscope was. And so she went and she used that. But this led to a problem and the problem was we didn't have a good microscope to use. How are we going to do the subsequent experiments? This I solved uh, by calling up all of the sales representatives of the microscope companies that were selling in New York City. And I said to them, we've just made a wonderful discovery of a way of looking at gene expression that uses a fluorescence microscope. So we are definitely buying a fluorescence microscope, but we really don't know which one to buy. We'd like to try yours out. And if you could bring a loaner by the lab, we'll give it a good workout, especially if you leave it here for maybe a month or two, and we'll see what we can do with it. And so all the experiments were done on loaner microscopes, but we were able to show that it not only worked in E. coli, but uh, subsequently in worms. Now, this experiment, that in fact did work the first time that Gia uh, did the experiment. It's sort of interesting because no one believed it was going to work. And I wanna to explain to you why no one thought this was a good idea for an experiment. This is a section of the GFP molecule. Now, um, if you look at the uh, the molecule, you see there's a serine and then a tyrosine and a glycine and so on. What connects all of these different amino acids is what's called the peptide backbone. This is a line of atoms. And that's how proteins are put together, one amino acid at a time. But the GFP molecule is really strange because five of the atoms in this backbone rearrange in the final product and they make a five-membered ring, putting a kink in the sequence. But this also allows the molecule to be fluorescent. And when we started our experiments, people knew about this, but they had no idea how it was done. How did the molecule get this strange form? And they thought, the only way this could be done is with an enzyme. And that maybe one, maybe five enzymes. No one knew how it was made. But everyone was convinced it would not work on its own. Gia's experiment says it is its own enzyme. Whatever it is, it's doing it on its own. We don't need anything else. So she took a chance. Unfortunately, it worked. Now, the clone uh, can be diagrammed, the DNA that was used, as uh, that we, everyone got, and there were three other labs that got this from Douglas Prasher, was, I'm diagramming it here, 
The green part is the part that codes for GFP. The red part are, is, are just extraneous jellyfish sequence that happened to be there in the clone that was, that was distributed to all of us. So three other labs had the same idea. Let's see if GFP works. And so they tried it. They all failed and we succeeded. Why? I believe the reason is that they were careful and we were sloppy. Or maybe to put it a slightly different way, we were careful in a different way. What do I mean by this? In 1989 or 1992, when we did this experiment, there were two, there still are two general ways of making lots of DNA. The first is you hire an expert. And the expert that everybody liked to hire was E. coli. Bacteria had been making DNA forever. And so if you put this into a bacterium, you could grow it up and it would make wonderful copies of it. If that's the case, then they needed to cut out what they wanted. They wanted to have the, the piece they wanted. So they cut out the, the jellyfish section, which goes from two enzyme positions that you see here, labeled ECOR1. I didn't want to have anything extra. And so I suggested to Gia that she not do that and that instead she use polymerase chain reaction amplified from those two green arrows to represent the primers that would only give us the green part and that she used that and that's what she did her experiment worked the other three experiments didn't we believe although no one has really looked into it in great detail that there's something in the red bits that make this not work. And so getting rid of them turned out to be a wonderful thing because then she could show it could work on its own. But for those other three groups, they would have done perfectly good experiments, but they would have gotten no fluorescent products. And they would have concluded, yes, what people have said about there being a converting enzyme, that must be true. But in fact, it was not true. And we were very fortunate that this happened. Well, why is GFP, why was GFP accepted as something that lots of people wanted to use and did use? Oh, I should mention, we did put it in worms. Um, we published the work and uh, this is the cover that Mark was referring to. And uh, just very quickly, I want to go through some of the problems here. Um, the, uh, we um, submitted uh, the paper, and the paper had this title here, uh, Green Fluorescent with a New Marker for Gene Expression. And the editor rejected the paper and called me up and said, I'm rejecting the paper because you cannot use the word new in science. Everything in science is new uh, and you cannot use that word. And I said, can I change the title? I did. I'm not going to read it. You can see that it's a very extensive title. Uh, I was very angry and that's why I gave it this long title. The paper got accepted and after it was accepted, I asked, uh, I, the editor called me up and said, do you think you could make it shorter? At which point I said, I'll try, and then just had the, the final title as green fluorescent protein as a marker for gene expression, which is the official title. The picture that you see here on the cover was one I really wanted to have, and I was very happy when the cover editor asked me, uh, said that they were thinking of putting it on the cover, but then completely dismayed when she said, you know, the worst color we can put on the cover is green. Can we change the color of the animal? And I said, no, that's just not going to happen. And the third problem I had with trying to publish this paper was the fact that my, uh, that we had already given away samples to many people and they had started writing back to me and saying, you know, it works in my system. This is great. And so I wanted to cite that 
in my paper to say there's unpublished work that shows this is useful in other organisms. And I asked everyone for permission and virtually everyone did say, yes, you gave us this before you published, of course you can cite our unpublished work. So there's a footnote that designates all this. But one person gave me a particularly hard time in this. And this is her picture and the letter that she wrote when I asked her for permission. And basically what she's saying is that we can cite her work if I make coffee uh, every Saturday for two months running, uh, prepare a special French dinner and take out the garbage nightly for a month. This is my wife. But what she did was a really exciting and wonderful experiment. And even though she still to this day says, I have not paid up completely, I believe I have paid. But what did she do? Genes have basically two parts. They have the part that is the product, the RNA or the protein that's ultimately going to be made, the instructions for the product that's going to be made. And then it has the part that says, that controls everything, where, when, how much is being made. What we had shown in our experiment, that we could take that regulatory part, put and have that drive the production of GFP, and GFP would then be seen. So we could test where a gene was being activated. What Tula did was the wonderful experiment of taking the entire gene, the regulatory part, the product part, and adding GFP like a caboose on a train. And so wherever the protein went, she would be able to see that protein because it fluoresced green. And she did this work in E. coli. And this is one of her pictures here. What you're seeing is what's called an egg chamber. The, uh, the black Dots on the left, the large black dots, are cell nuclei of what are called nurse cells. All the green is the protein she's interested in, and it's all being transported, and she could watch the protein move into the cell in the upper right-hand corner, which is the developing oocyte, the developing egg in Drosophila. So it was a wonderful demonstration that one could do this. GFP has been uh, is exciting, as I said, because all you have to do is put the DNA for it into an organism and the organism and all of its sub subsequent progeny are going to have that DNA. Being able to visualize it just requires shining blue light. It's small, so it labels all the cells and it can be seen in living organisms. And let me give you a couple of examples of this. So here's a uh, set of pictures of a bunch of animals that are uh, expressing GFP and some cells, but I wanna really go past this and show you a couple of movies. So the two movies that I'm gonna show, uh, the one on the left has GFP that binds to a protein that's part of the spindle. And the movie that I'm gonna show on the left is of an early embryo in Drosophila that is dividing four times. So let's watch that. And you can watch the divisions happen. And I hope as you see this, you realize that the divisions are all happening at the same time. This is synchronous. In fact, Rosalind Silverman Gavrilla, who I believe was a graduate student at the time she made these movies in Canada, uh, called this movie In Synchrony. And it immediately raises the question, how, are, how is this coordinated division taking place? Now the movie on the right is GFP attached to a protein or a part of a protein that will bring it into the nucleus. And you can see by the diagram in the middle that there's a nucleus before division and there's a nucleus after division. But in between, no nucleus, so anything that would be in the nucleus should go all over. And so, Again, we're looking at several divisions on the right, and now this is falsely colored. So the more GFP there is, the more towards the red end of the rainbow. The less it is, more towards the blue. So the color is what we call false color, and you can see the division. Cell division takes place. Now it's everywhere in the embryo, 
The nuclei start to reform. She calls this after the Van Gogh painting, Starry Night. And you can see the nuclei breaking down. Again, all over the, uh, uh, the uh, embryo and the nuclei reform. And the interesting thing here is that this is not really synchronous. It goes from the lower left or lower right to the upper left hand corner. Uh, some of us believe that the reason for this is her thumb was a little heavy on the uh, cover slip when she was making this prep. And so it's a slightly damaged embryo, but you can see how, how even that comes up by being able to look over time. Now, um, one thing about scientists is uh, there's, a, there's a book I, I remember reading to my daughter, which is If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And in that book, if you give a mouse a cookie, it asks for a glass of milk, and then it asks for a straw, and then it asks for a napkin, and it keeps asking. And I've realized that that's a perfect uh, analogy to, to scientists, because you give them a perfectly good green fluorescent protein, and the first thing they say is, we want more colors. And the person who did that, plus many other wonderful innovations, was Roger Chen. And here is his picture uh, with some of these uh, uh, different fluorescent proteins that he made. Because after all, if you make multiple fluorescent proteins, you can see different types of cells. And Jeff Lichtman and Josh Sains at Harvard developed this into a beautiful set of reagents to label cells in the brain, which are notoriously hard to keep track of, which they call brain bow, and which you can see in this picture. Um, when I think about any discovery, such as GFP, I think about it as having uh, a number of different consequences. And there certainly have been lots of consequences that people have used this. So I'm going to divide this quickly into fundamental, applied, and unexpected. And uh, for this, uh, let me give you some examples of what I mean by this. Um, fundamental. GFP, GFP has been used in thousands of experiments to look at basic biological problems and in so doing, new discoveries have made. So it's a discovery leading to other discoveries, just as the laser led to a, a discovery of, of gravity waves or of low temperature uh, physics and, and other uh, wonderful discoveries, uh, GFP has led to a number of new discoveries, one of which uh, by Cliff Brangman and Tony Hyman is of a completely new type of organelle within cells, which are these phase separated molecules. And this is one of their pictures. But it's also been used in applied ways to study problems that uh, relate, for example, to human health. And one example of that is to examine the question of how is a virus transmitted from cell to cell. When we teach how viruses work in uh, elementary biology classes, we often talk about viruses being part of a cell, the cell lyses, it breaks apart, and the virus is spewing everywhere, and other cells pick it up. But does that really happen? And investigators looked specifically at mouse cells that were infected with the AIDS virus, HIV, and asked, how is that virus transmitted? And as you can see here, the green cell is the one with the virus, and you can hardly see the other cell that doesn't have it, but you'll see the particle of the virus go from the labeled cell now into the new cell. No explosion. What does this mean? Well, if there had been an explosion, maybe then that virus could have been bound to antibodies. But if it's going from one cell into another, maybe the antibodies are not gonna be as useful. And what we really need to do is to find a way of blocking this transfer from one cell to another. And then there have been truly unexpected things. For example, um, one of the things that I was quite interested in is uh, Bob Burlage, who was at Oak Ridge National Lab, made E. coli, with GFP, but the GFP would only be made if the E. coli were around the explosive TNT. It sounds a little strange. 
He could grow them in petri dishes, and if TNT was there, he'd get green fluorescent protein in the bacteria. But his real goal was to find a way to detect landmines that he knew, because he knew landmines leak TNT. And so he had a friend bury five landmines in a field, three, a three meter by five meter, meter plot of land, cover it with dirt. Now these were not connected, but they did have the TNT in them. He sprayed the area with the bacteria and then came back at night to see where the fluorescent bacteria were. And he was able to find where those landmines had been buried. Now this experiment has been repeated by a number of different groups. There is one major problem. And that problem is you never want to have a false negative because that's deadly. And so people are very actively working on making this a reality, something that would protect, especially all the innocent people that are subject to injury by landmines well after combatants leave the area. And one final unexpected thing, um, GFP has been used to explain uh, a rather unusual individual and his coloration, and that's this person. Uh, the Hulk, uh, at the beginning of the Ang Lee movie Hulk, you actually see some work done on the jellyfish and the isolation of the protein, which is quite nice. So what does all this say about GFP and about uh, science? Well, let me just go back to my other things again. Now, I didn't say this, but Roger Chen actually won uh, a very prestigious contest in the United States called the Science Talent Search when he was a high school student. He showed promise exceptionally early. Uh, in these talks, I normally do not show my grades from college because I'm afraid that when the Nobel Committee sees my chemistry grades, they're going to take the prize away from me. So my answer to our scientists geniuses, I would say some, but certainly not all, and certainly none of us all of the time, or none of these people all of the time. Do scientists' experiments work every time? Well, Shimmer Moore certainly didn't. We were very fortunate that ours did, but I would say they happen rarely. Do scientists use the scientific method? Well, unless you call throwing things on the in the sink, the scientific method, I don't think that's the case. Where the science, so this idea that you have to come up with a hypothesis first, and then you do the test and everything ensues from that, I think that's wrong. I think what really happens is that you're working on something, you make a discovery, and then from that discovery, you derive a hypothesis. So I don't think it, scientists use the scientific method initially, but they do so after they've made a discovery. Do scientists work alone? Well, this is the picture of the people that are, were part of our initial thing. People don't work alone, uh, rarely. Shimon Moore actually did work alone uh, most of his life, but not all of it. And finally, the idea, are, is science done only by white men? Well, that's complete nonsense, so we won't do that. Let me finish by talking about some other lessons that I think GFP has made in all of this. The first is that I think scientific success comes in many routes. Shimamura, Chen, and myself, all are uh, scientists that are, were passionate about what we did, were excited about the experiments we did, but we had very, very different uh, upbringings and uh, to get us to the point where we became scientists. So I don't think there's one way of becoming a scientist. Uh, I think many, if most, discoveries are in fact accidental. There's a wonderful phrase um, by Enrico Fermi that says, if you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, you've made a measurement. But if it doesn't confirm your hypothesis, then you've made a discovery. I think it's really good to just be willing to try things, not take what everybody tells you. GFP cannot work on its own. This is never going to happen. Don't waste your time doing it. 
try the experiment. We often talk about weekend experiments where no one is around, where you can talk about, you can do something that you just have to find the answer to. And if it works, you crow about it Monday morning. If it doesn't work, just ask people how their weekend went. Finally, I think the idea about individuals making scientific discoveries really ignores the fact that science progress is really a cumulative effect. Shimamura's paper came out in 1962. It enabled everything. But if it hadn't been for the work of all the people that I've talked about today, plus actually thousands of other people that use GFP and its derivatives, no one would have cared. And that's what made it important. It was the cumulative effect of everybody working together. Um, this will seem like a little advertisement that university and grant support was essential, but what it really is saying is something that I think non-scientists don't hear as much, and that is that we do not work on contracts. We are, we are not saying, I will do A, B, and C, and if, you, if I do them, pay me. We say, I want to work on this problem. I believe the best way of doing the research is to do A, B, and C, and then the part we never write in the grant proposal. However, if we make one of those discoveries, we're gonna go and find out about that. And in fact, it's that ability to be able to look at the unusual, the unexpected, the discovery that actually pushes forward science, I think, a great deal. I think the real innovators in the lab are not the people that are the heads of the lab that usually sit in their office and talk on the telephone, but in fact, the students and postdocs. And in fact, when we started giving GFP away, the heads of the lab called me up to ask about it, but almost invariably they would say, you know, there's a postdoc or a graduate student or an undergraduate working in my lab, and they heard about this thing you have, green fluorescent pills, they want it. What the hell is it? What are you, what are you doing with it? And I tell them and they say, oh yeah, we'd like that. Please send it. But it was the students and the postdocs that were pushing the science. And that's certainly the case in my lab. I think that all life should be studied, not just a few organisms. We sometimes talk about these uh, organisms that lots of people work on as model organisms. C. elegans has become a model organism. I actually don't even like the word model organism. I think the word model organism is something that was invented by people that didn't like these organisms to imply that their function is solely to model human disease. They are models for something else. In fact, that's completely untrue. Yes, they do model things, and sometimes they do it quite wonderfully. But it, the real plus that comes out of these organisms is the discoveries of things we didn't even imagine were in human biology, such as those organelles uh, that are part of the cytoplasm, or cell death genes, or RNAi or microRNAs or other things that have been discovered by working on these, or, or these organisms. And in fact, I don't know who told me this, but I've stolen this term. I wish I knew who it was that told me. I'd give them better credit. But I don't call these things model organisms anymore. I refer to them because they show us the new ways as pioneer organisms. And my final, and obviously all life should be studied, and what you're doing in Gloucester, I think, amplifies that as well, is that there's a wealth of information to be found, and we should not restrict ourselves to only a few things. And the final point really amplifies this, again, is that fundamental research is essential. If we look now during this pandemic, and you look at all the different approaches that people are taking to making vaccines or taking to develop new drugs or trying to understand the virus, all of that is based on basic <coughs> research. And without that, it just could not be done. So I'm gonna leave everyone, and I've gone way over time, but I'm gonna leave everyone with my favorite quote about basic research. 
uh, which is uh, uh, comes from uh, Robert R. Wilson. Robert R. Wilson was a physicist, the first head of the Fermi lab, and in 1969, during the middle of the, Viet the war in Vietnam, he was asked by Congress to explain why Congress should spend a lot of money on a science project, the making of the particle accelerator at the Fermi lab. And uh, he went and talked to a joint committee of Congress, and they started asking him questions. And the main thing, because probably it was in the middle of a war, they said, how will this help national security? Tell us how many ways. And he said, none. And then a little bit later, they said, no, no, really. Uh, they kept asking the question. Finally, John Pastore from Rhode Island uh, asked him, no, look, uh, doc, Dr. Wilson, tell us in what respect will this particle accelerator help the national defense? At which point he said the following. It has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with whether we are good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country except to make it worth defending. Thank you very much. Probably the only one that you can hear clapping, uh, Marty, but from all the comments that we're getting here, um, just the last one I just got is, this was a fantastic talk. Okay. Thank so you. We have time maybe for two quick questions. Well, First, whatever you want to take. I, I, see, and, I, and I I'm think fine. Yes. Yeah, so this was really beautiful. One thing that people keep asking, though, is what is the main function of GFP? Why, why is it there in the first place in the natural world? So that, this is a very uh, unanswered question at the moment. So one could go back a step and say, why is there bioluminescence? Why does the jellyfish produce light? And there's a number of theories of that. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to address that one first. So that, so uh, fireflies, for example, use it to attract mates and uh, other organisms use it to scare away prey or to attract, uh, uh, rather, scare away predators and, or to attract prey. Uh, the one theory that I quite like about the jellyfish is that the dome of the jellyfish has the uh, cells that produce light around the edge. And for some jellyfish, not particularly this one, they actually go in a circle uh, when they light up. And so someone thought, well, gee, what does that do? And so they took those, uh, those things that you get at restaurants when they make you wait to get a table, and then the lights come on and the, there's a ring of light. Well, they did that, but they mimicked the light of the jellyfish and they put it on the ocean bottom and they turned it on and very quickly squids came. And so what they thought was, this is a way that the jellyfish recruits help. If it's being preyed upon, it gets a bigger predator, the squid, to come and kill off whatever that thing is. Whether that's the truth or not, I don't know, but I love the idea. It's what about GFP? Why is that the case? Well, one of the things we know is that without GFP, the jellyfish would give off a blue light. Now, interestingly, jellyfish, my understanding of it, jellyfish that live deep in the sea, their green light cannot penetrate. And the only light that penetrates is blue light. And those jellyfish just make blue light. But the jellyfish at the surface make green light. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions is, why is that? And the model that I particularly like for why this may have evolved is one that Shimamura suggested. And it has to do with the fact that if you have two molecules, one that produces light that is activated, it mm -hmm. can transfer that energy to another molecule. So that he believed that a quorum was activated, transfer, instead of making blue light, it transferred its energy to GFP and GFP 
produce green light. But was there an advantage to that? It turns out that the chemical reaction that makes blue light in a corin is very poor. It only works 10% of the time. What about blue light change to green for GFP? Amazingly efficient. It works 90% of the time. But if you put the two molecules next to each other, the chemical reaction doesn't have to make blue light, it just has to activate GFP. It works 30% of the time. So it goes from 10% light production to 30% light production. So a threefold increase, and that may have been a big enough advantage yes. for the jellyfish to have this protein. Again, hypothesis, but uh, I think a quite attractive one. One interesting, it sounds technical, but I love it because it really tells you the audience, uh, this is, I don't, uh, yeah, not, the audience really loved this. Somebody I think is interesting, is they're asking, how did you do this before CRISPR? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it took us a little longer to do this, but there was a lot of molecular biology before CRISPR. Um, and, uh, you know, it was standard molecular biology techniques, uh, amplifying things by PCR, cutting them with enzymes, making plasmids or other vectors that would bring uh, the DNA into the cells or the organism that you wanted, uh, transforming those organisms so they had the DNA and then growing them up. Beautiful. And then, so a, a bunch of people really, I guess you, you really explained very well how you know, during that seminar of 1989, you already basically had it in your mind that, that if this worked, that this was going to be big. But and people understood all that. But people are asking, when did the world really realize it? You know, I was sort of mentioning the cover, but when did the, when did the world realize by, you know, how many years did it take, I guess? You know, so to take? so it, it depends on what part of the world you're talking about. And by that, I'm not meaning a country, I'm meaning an area of research. So because we did our experiments in C. elegans, the C. elegans community used this instantaneously. They realized that this could be used as a marker for gene expression, for looking at proteins in the transparent animal, and that took off. The same thing happened with yeast. There were people that found that yeast could do it. And zebrafish, uh, Nancy Hopkins at MIT, uh, was I think the first person to, to use zebrafish. And so, and, and my wife was the first one who did Drosophila. And so people, uh, so in those organisms, uh, basically you get an exponential rise. So people very early said, this is a tool we can use, especially if one person had used the tool, then they did that. Where it, and, and people used it in cell culture. There were, there were things in cell culture, but I think it was a little slow to be used in mouse. And people were saying, well, how can we see it? You know, it, it, this is not going to be as useful. So I think it took a couple of years before people realized that it could be a very useful marker for studies in mice of gene expression and, and other things as well. And, and then it took off from them. But uh, there, it, I, I have, a, it, there was a little bit of skepticism at the beginning. Um, uh, there's a, a friend who was a, just a beginning professor at Yale when this was started and he was looking at uh, he, he told me this story. He said he, he had been at the Salk Institute uh, and um, as a postdoc, had gone to Yale to do it, set up his lab. And then when he, uh, he had returned after one year and was visiting people and happened to see a friend in the hall and the friend comes up to him and says, oh, what have you been doing? And he says, I have been putting, I, I've been uh, putting GFP into human nerve cells in culture. At least that's why I remember it, but nerve cells in culture. And the friend says to him, you know, we tried it. It doesn't work. Don't waste your time. 
and which surprised him because he then said to his friend, well, actually I'm giving a talk in about a half an hour and I'm gonna show you that it works. <laughs> and that was it. So there were some people that were a little skeptical at first and that's probably a good thing in science. But in fact, um, people, you know, you could see it. And that's the nice thing about this is that you, it's, it's really easy to see. So I think people yes. uh, immediately saw that it would be useful for their work. So Marty, we've gone over time. It was fascinating. I apologize to all the people who've put really good questions up there, but we don't have time for them. But really the message to you, uh, Marty, is people love this. I'm gonna to read to you a very short, the, the short one I got. Uh, I love this talk, thank you, with a smile at the end. So, so that, that's how thank we're gonna finish this. Thank you again for your time. This was lovely, both on the Lessons no. of life and science and on the science itself. And I'm going to give it back to Chris. Thank so you. before you do that, Mark, if, if, if you want to, I, I can't write long things, but if, peop, if, if you want to send me the, the questions, maybe I can try to address some of them. Okay, I will. I will. We can do that by email. Yeah. See you soon, Marty. Take care. Thank you both. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Marty and Mark. And Marty, thank you for that generous offer. We will send you the questions and try to get them uh, answered for all the viewers. Really getting great, amazing feedback. Uh, people were using the Q&A to send compliments and bravo. So thank you all out there for watching both tonight and since we began the talks in April. Please know that we have a great new slate of Science Hour speakers already lining up for September. And you personally are gonna have a chance to help influence the choice of speakers and topics for the fall lineup. So you're gonna get a very short survey uh, via email from Ashley Destino tomorrow. And please take a minute to share with us your thoughts and feedback. Lastly, we are recording tonight's talk. So you can email Ashley if you'd like a link to the recording and we'll be sending that out. We're also in the process of putting up many of the talks on our website later this summer. So that's it. Um, thank you all for being with us. Email us with any other questions that didn't get answered tonight or thoughts you might like to share. We, we truly love to hear from you. So thank you again to Mark for, for making this happen, for Marty for joining us, the amazing storytelling and insights. This was truly wonderful. Be well, everyone. Good night and goodbye from the GMGI Science Hour. Until September. <laughs>